just, just so clear, just, you know, let's get down to business to defeat the puns. Yes. is the best pun of the day. <laughs> I <laughs> <laughs> um, Alright, so I guess we'd better do a talk because I'm standing really awkwardly. So Alex is going to come and talk to us about some like retro development stuff she does, which is really cool because of like Game Boy games and SNES games and everything's exciting. So she's going to come here and you should clap me loudly. <laughs> Biology. Um, I took all the sciences and I was told without maths I couldn't do computing. So I went to study zoo biology and got bored after two weeks of being told, when you're a zookeeper, you're going to do this. When you're a zookeeper, I don't want to be a zookeeper. So I phoned administration and they said, I said, I want to switch course. I said, what are you studying? Zoo biology. I said, what do you want to switch to? I said, computer studies. They laughed at me, but they did let me switch. And that for a year, I fell in love with programming, and I switched to an even more programming-heavy course and did games. So then, um, Global Game Jam 2012. Uh, it's a 48-hour programming competition. I'm sure you all know what Global Game Jam is. Um, but after declaring that X and A was just too easy, uh, my friend Luke, who's a PhD candidate, decided he wanted to make a Mega Drive game. So it was my first game jam. I'd been programming for four months. I was like, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, C, that, that can't be that different from C++. It'd be fine. So we wrote in Chris Font, who um, was known at uni as the esoteric C programmer by all the lecturing staff. Um, and, and we went, we rocked up with a 300 page manual for the <coughs> Mega Drive, a Mega Drive and the development cartridge. We uh, to <coughs> deploy it. I don't think we, we didn't read the manual. Uh, I don't think we even opened the manual the whole weekend. But it's fine. It's fine. Um, so we were using a library called the Save Genesis Dev which was a tool chain with a compiler. It had some library code as well, which was kind of cool. So here I have at the top, you can have Hello World. So that, that is all the code you'd need, just that main, it's like five lines, and that will actually draw stuff on a Mega Drive and it will work, and it's fine. Um, so that's the start of the library. So it took care of a lot of basics, it helped us do tile maps and control, controller input, and stuff like that, um, which was really lucky because it took the whole of the first evening just to get the compiler to work. <laughs> so. But it was fine. By three o'clock on Saturday, we'd we'd sorted out how to do things, but we didn't have a game idea at all. Um, we talked about the wheel of cheese, and then and then we discovered that actually in the in the library, undocumented, were a load of three D functions. It did a load of three D maths for us. So uh, infinite space was born. It was it was very very simple. You're a spaceship. And you have asteroids coming towards you and you have to avoid them, so it's just a survival game. Um, but we made the model using Blender, um, and then just took the vertices from that and put them in our game, which you can see in the middle there, that is, that is it. Um, although the Mega Drive is pretty good, and it did have quite a few 3D capabilities, it does quite a lot of stuff. It's a lot more powerful than the SNES, um, but the SNES has an on more graphics chip, which makes it better anyway. For certain things, um, so we couldn't do that. We had, we couldn't calculate our normals on the fly. So Chris started trying to do it by hand, and I opened Excel, and we had an Excel spreadsheet that did all our normal math things for us. Um, which also just then put in the code like that. It was it was fine. Um, so it worked. It was very simple, but we we won third place with it, which was pretty cool. Um, and uh, it ran on a Mega Drive. We didn't have to change anything. We, like, took, we couldn't test it out of the jam because they didn't have a television. 
in the hospital. <laughs> By the time we actually learned how to use the Game Boy, we had like 24 hours. So in true Game Jam style, we totally ran out of time. And um, we basically made Desert Bus for the Game Boy. Um, I'm not going to take any responsibility for that, though. I was pretty much in charge of the music once we'd figured out how to use the library that we, were, we had. Um, ben used a uh, Game Boy to he used the Game Boy to make music. He used LSDJ, which is a tracker for the Game Boy. Um, turns out you shouldn't do that. Don't write Game Boy music on the Game Boy because there is no way to get it off of the Game Boy and into your game. Um, which was kind of new. Like, I wasn't expecting that. I was because there are, the, there are LSDJ players, but it turns out that they just basically copied the code and removed all the controls. There is no like simplified version, but oh well. In um, so I don't know if you if you don't know what LSDJ is, it's the kind of program that like Chipsal, who did all the music for Super Hexagon, that's all written using LSDJ. So um, yeah, we did it programmatically in the end. So you, you can see though, it's actually quite simple. You have notes, and then you have the frequency that corresponds to that note, which is just like found on the internet. It's free available. Um, and then Ben had to sit there and write all of his notes out for me so that we could put it in the game. But it was fine. That was probably the best bit of the music. Um, but no one at the game jam had realized that it was a Game Boy game until at the end of our video when it's just Ben casually picking up a Game Boy, turning it on, and just playing the game. And everyone's like, What's going on? How did you do that? <laughs> That's what we do at Game Jams. <laughs> we, um, we actually started planning our next year's escapades <coughs> in the car on the way home from that jam. Um, I really wanted to do a SNES game, and I got my wish because we were asked to make a SNES game uh, at Play Expo in, in Blackpool. So we planned to start the game and learn how to use all of the tools and stuff at Global this year, just now. It was a total disaster. It was so cold in Lincoln and we weren't supposed to be staying over, so we had no sleeping stuff, no warm clothes, and we just froze. It was my final year, so as usual, we did no preparation before we went. Um, <coughs> as you can see, the cartridge that we had doesn't even have a case on it, because it only just arrived in time. Um, yes. And we went it alone this time. Uh, Luke and I had a compiler for the SNES, but we didn't use any libraries um, because I don't know why we didn't use any libraries. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I actually I preferred it because apparently I'm a masochist and don't need to speak. Um, so we spent a lot of the weekend writing tools. We spent a lot of the weekend writing framework code for like animation and collision and stuff. Um, it was very, very different 
For example, before we could do anything, we had to write the 200 line file that was just what registers did what so we could access those. Um, which took quite a while. I, like, I can't show you how I'm well for this because I don't have any alphanumeric tiles yet, so I can't write things on the tiles. <coughs> I've got a game, but it doesn't have any words in it yet. Um, well, that's fine. So by the end of the weekend, we had a platformer that you can move around. Um, we had a tool that converted <coughs> Photoshop palettes into SNES palettes, which was really useful because um, that made everything a lot easier when we wanted to change things. There was a tool that was supposed to convert GIF images into SNES code, but it doesn't work on 64-bit machines or Windows 7 or at all. <laughs> um, so we wrote GIF 3 SNES, which just takes a GIF image and gives you tiles. It was perfect, really, for what we needed. It's just command, command line, but it works. We also had a tile macro user, which let you make a really big GIF image, and it found it, like, took all of the sprites, gave you a tile map and the sprite set that you need, which was really useful. So we didn't, we didn't get very far in the game jam, uh, but oh well. But unlike every other year, it wasn't over there because we still had to write this game for May. Um, so these websites became my bible uh, forever. Uh, you can see, I, I, these are my favorite quotes um, from, from the website. It's not impossible. <laughs> Unlike most other retro platforms, it's entirely reverse engineered from games because Nintendo are mean and won't let anyone see their code. Um, so it was it was interesting. I mean, I clearly remember Luke messaging me at one o'clock in the morning, going, "We need to figure out how much data you can transfer each frame." I was like, "Okay." But it depends, because 50 hertz and 60, if we're in America, you can transfer more data per frame than here, which makes no sense. Um, and it was, it was the deepest we've ever had to go into anything like that. And it was, it was an experience, because there, there's no abstraction, it's just addressing the hardware. And at one point, the wiki went offline for about a week, and that was the worst week. Um, as soon as it came back, I just downloaded everything. I was like, no, I need this. You can see there's an export button specifically for that purpose, because it's not a very reliable website. So, I'm quickly going to deviate and talk a little bit about how that's changed me playing retro games, because once you understand how the registers and everything work, there is, it's really easy to understand how glitches work in all those retro games. So it's, so you can invalidate the memory, um, but it's not going to cause crashes, it just does unexpected things. But they're actually completely expected because you, you have complete control over what's in each register. So this is a really good example. This is Donkey Kong. Uh, I know the pictures are awful, but they are actual pictures off of my TV because I've managed to do this. <coughs> so I know it's a thing. But basically, you can ride a rhinoceros. If you get off the rhinoceros, and you, which is grey, and you throw a silver barrel, which is grey, at a wall and then jump on it, as you go back past the rhinoceros, if you don't let go of the button to keep you on the barrel, and you also press the button to get on the rhino, the game gets really, really confused, and instead of loading the rhino sprite, it reloads the character sprite, because you... <laughs> but the palette data isn't affected, so you end up with a silver Donkey Kong. And if you were playing as Diddy Kong, it does the same thing, but it comes up with him. And it will stay that way until it has any kind of reason to refresh and reload all the sprite data. So that was pretty cool to learn. Um, but finally, uh, so... For the Play Expo, we had our SNES game that we, I'm still, we're still working on. Um, we came up with the sprites and the idea before we went, only a week before. We had like five months and we waited till the week before. <laughs> As usual. But we made the, I made the Robin Hood sprite and from that we, we the, the whole game was sort of worn out of that. Um, so Luke, Luke did some art, he did all the backgrounds, which are pretty awesome. 
Um, and then at the expo, we wrote the game using all the tools and framework code that we'd written at GTJ. So it wasn't a complete waste of time. Uh, so it's a, it's a medieval archery brawler. It's two player at the moment. You have a sword and a bow and an arrow, uh, and you just have to kill each other into infinity because there's no scoring, because there's no tiles. <laughs> yeah. But what that does mean is that people just keep playing it because they, they forget. <laughs> Continually. <laughs> that's pretty awesome. The fact that people are doing that is pretty good. So we've taken it to quite a few events this year and um, we've got loads of ideas and loads of features to add and suggestions that people have made. Um, but the main thing is going to be the text. And also, we've got to copy bits of memory around, which it's going to be fun to learn. <laughs> That's my next thing to do, really. So I hope this has given you into a little bit of insight into how we do what we do and where to start. Mega Drive, because it's easy. Why we do it is mainly for the nostalgia and the challenge, because uh, it is so very, very different. Um, and it's a completely different experience. Um, so yeah, thank you. Questions? So is it um, for the, the SNES you've built a set of tools and some frameworks and hydro code and so on? Um, do you have plans to publish any of that? Yes, most definitely. Sure. But they were written at the game jam and they do need to be tidied a little bit. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> yeah, good. Um, it would be nice if they weren't all command line as well. It would be, we could like combine them all into a thing where you just press a button for which one you want to do. That might be quite. Command line's cool though. That's true. <laughs> Yeah. If you're right for the SNES, yeah, you, you, you'd be happy to come on like, oh, this what I do. <laughs> there is actually, there is a library now I found. Uh, I haven't tried it. This. Who knows? <laughs> um, anyone Have you found that making games <coughs> for consoles that are far simpler than the ones we are now is kind of like a streamlined great design process? You find you now focus on the, uh, don't worry, I'm not going to you. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just can't hear you, I'm deaf. <laughs> have you found that coding for simpler consoles has streamlined your design process and gotten you to focus on like kind of the core elements of your game rather than just chucking tons of shit at it as modern games tend to do? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> Simply because uh, Luke and I are both very much programmers, we're not game designers, and that's probably one of the reasons we do this because we want to learn and it's all about the experience of figuring out how to do this stuff and the fact that when we are doing this stuff even though it's a completely tiny niche market of people that care um, we are really contributing to that and anything that we do can and probably would be used by anyone else who wanted to do it which is kind of nice to think about um, but as for like coding we wrote some animation classes that were too complex for the SNES to run. It doesn't tell you that, it just doesn't work. There's no debugging on the SNES. It's <laughs> so if, it, if it looks right, it might have worked. How do you debug on the SNES? You don't. <laughs> there is, for the Mega Drive, there is someone in Nottingham who now has a complete uh, Sega Mega Drive dev kit, which has like a hardware debugger. Um, but no, not the SNES. So what do you do if something goes wrong? You cry. <laughs> why when we did the global game jam we still took the snares and we still took the cartridge and every time we made a change we tested it <laughs> because if something went wrong there was absolutely no way of telling what it was or why it was going wrong which was awful <laughs> but yeah you just can't there is and without tiles you can't even write something if you think you can't like print anything on the screen <laughs> But we have a game! Fine! <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Uh, how reliable is testing something on an emulator? Sorry? How reliable is testing on an emulator as opposed to testing on the actual physical hardware itself? Um, yeah, so we did the first thing that we did, we did it ran on an emulator, it didn't run on the console at all. Even now, the game runs on the console, but I have a SNES portable console um, from America, it doesn't run on that. <laughs> it, like, it runs, but it has crazy, like, it's just got sprites all over the screen that I don't know where they're coming from. No one does. <laughs> that's, a, that's a brand new portable American console, and it'll be fine.